Okay, welcome back to this uh, session, which is now a public talk by Professor Abhay Ashtekar. A uh, few words of uh, introduction. You have heard him many times in the talks and his previous talk, but there may be few people who are newer. So I would like to make a few introductory remarks. Uh, Professor Ashtekar was born on July 5th, 1949 in Maharashtra. He, his education was in different places uh, with undergraduate completing in uh, Institute of Science, Mumbai. He got his PhD from University of Chicago in 1974. Uh, he has worked extensively in the field of classical and quantum gravity. Uh, in classical general relativity, his notable works include uh, characterization of asymptotically flat space times. The next stage is, of course, the famous Ashtigar variables, uh, which gives an alternative formulation of Einstein's theory which is crucial for subsequent development of canonical quantum gravity. Uh, he also developed with his collaborators the theory of isolated and dynamical horizons, which is a generalization of black holes. Uh, and he is one of the founders of loop quantum gravity. Uh, he continues to lead the, its development. With his collaborators, most recently he has demonstrated the resolution of Big Bang singularity, about which he talked yesterday. Uh, he has held several distinguished positions and is presently the Eberly Professor and Director of Institute of Gravitation and uh, the Cosmos. He is a member of several professional bodies, including American Physical Society, Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy, and uh, I think Deputy President of International Society for General Relativity and Gravitation. Today he will talk to us about the many faces of black holes. Uh, Abhay? Thank you. Okay, so since this fo talk follows, actually, the last public talk was uh, Shri's. So I just wanted to say that I really agree with the various things that Shri was advising students. And I would just like to add one more thing. One is that whether you decide to work in theory or experiment doesn't matter. Uh, but I think it's really, you have to have fire in your belly. If you don't have fire in your belly, don't do research. You, know, you really have to die in order to do something non-trivial. Uh, without that, you will not succeed. Okay. So this talk is dedicated to Chandra. Um, and he was a preeminent astrophysicist of this 20th century. He was a Nobel laureate. He received many, many honors, including three from the heads of three countries, namely uh, United States, um, Great Britain, and India. And for me, he was a teacher, a mentor, and a sage led by example. Okay, so coming to black holes, black holes are widely recognized as engines that drive the most energetic phenomena in astrophysics, and we already heard about this a little bit already in this uh, meeting, and you'll hear more about it in Professor Narayan's top public talk on Thursday. But black holes have also been engines behind some of the most unexpected and fascinating advances in mathematical and fundamental physics for over three decades. Professor Chandrasekhar himself made seminal contributions to the astrophysically important area of perturbation theory of black holes. So in this talk, what I would like to do is the following. I would like to really focus on the fact that black holes have been engines behind some of the most unexpected and fascinating fundamental physics phenomena. And I would like to provide an overview of the profound impact that black holes have had on the conceptual fabric of general relativity and also how they are leading us into quantum gravity and why they continue to be fascinating, intriguing, and vexing. The talk is divided into four parts. First, historical and conceptual setting. This is particularly for students. Then, something about black holes, which I find very fascinating some strangeness in proportion, the new challenges and unexpected vista, and then summary. So let me begin with the historical and conceptual setting. And the idea is simply that if I take a Newtonian gravity, then we all know that if I throw some object, it has some velocity, it climbs up some distance, and then comes down. But if I throw it sufficiently with a sufficiently large velocity, then you actually escape the gravitational field of the Earth. And in general, the escape velocity is given by 2 times Newton's constant times mass of the object, namely Earth, and the radius of Earth up here. 
And so you can just do a simple calculation to say that when would this be bigger than this or equal to the speed of light? And that would happen if 2gm upon rc squared would be bigger than or equal to 1. So naively you would say that in this case, even light would not escape from the surface of the body, and therefore it would be a black hole. Now suppose for simplicity that the object is, the body is actually has uniform density, then the mass would be given by 4 third pi r cube times rho, and therefore if I just substitute this mass up here, I get the equation that there is a black hole if and only if some constants time rho r squared is bigger than or equal to 1. So this is the quantity I want to make bigger than or equal to 1, and clearly there are two ways of achieving this. We can choose large rho and a reasonable r. Just for simplicity, let me suppose that I just want to have r to be about a kilometer, in which case I would need a density which is tremendous, about 6 times 10, 10 to the 16 grams per cubic centimeter. So this is about um, 600 times the nuclear density. Um, but I could, make, I could satisfy this equality. But I could also keep rho quite small, for example, rho to be just density of water. You just want to make a black hole in this sense out of a tank of water. You could do that, but then you would have to have huge radius and about 2.5 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. It is absolutely huge, 100 million kilometers. But then again, we would satisfy this condition, and therefore light would not escape. Interestingly, nature uses both these avenues. The first type of black holes result from stellar collapse the one in which there is a huge kind of density collapses, and, few, few, and there are a few kilometers in size, and a few times solar masses. And the second one exists in the centers of galaxies between a million and a billion solar masses. Now, these ideas are, in fact, very old. The surge of interest in this was about um, around late 1700s, about 100 years after Newton's Principia. This is from John Mitchell, and as far as I know, this is the first reference to black holes, what we today call black holes. He says in this paper, if there should exist in nature any such bodies of the type that I mentioned just now, we could have no information from sight. They would not be visible to us. Yet, if other luminous objects should appear to revolve around them, we might still perhaps, from the motion of these revolving bodies, infer the existence of the central ones with some degree of probability, as this might afford a clue to some of the apparent irregularities of the revolving bodies, which would not uh, be easily explicable by any other hypothesis. And this is very interesting. Sri showed us this picture about the center of, the, of a black hole in the center of our galaxy, a GRA star, and we have got these stars which are going around, and looking at the orbits of this star, we conclude that there is a compact object up here, about 4.3 million solar masses, and that is our own favorite, our own very own black hole in the center of our galaxy. There is also an apparently independent mention in Laplace's Exposition du Système du Monde. Um, it was interesting because this work appeared both before the French Revolution and after the French Revolution. And before the French Revolution, he was Monsieur Le Marquis de Laplace. And after the French Revolution, he was Peter Simon Laplace, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, so Laplace says, a um, luminous body of the same density as Earth, whose diameter is about 250 times larger than that of the sun, can, by its attractive power, prevent its light from reaching us. The escape velocity is bigger than the speed of light. And consequently, largest bodies in the universe could remain invisible to us. There exist, he goes on to say, there exist in the immensity of space opaque bodies as considerable in magnitude and perhaps equal, equally as numerous as stars. And it's pretty remarkable that these people were saying these things already around 1700. But all these ideas are conceptually flawed. They're just incorrect. Why? Because we're talking about Newtonian mechanics, and you all know about Newtonian mechanics and Newton's theory of gravity. And you know that all speeds are relative, including the speed of light. So when I calculated the escape velocity, that was with respect to the central body, the Earth. 
Supposing I was on such a body so that the escape velocity is bigger than the or is equal to the speed of light, so light or it's slightly bigger than the speed of light, so light cannot escape. Well, all I have to do is be on this body, jump up, and <laughs> so there will be objects which would be um, there will be charged particles which will be moving around, and they could emit light, and therefore their speed would be bigger than the speed of light. Another, perhaps easier way to think about it is. Supposing I had such an object, okay, right over there, with the escape velocity in Newtonian gravity is a equal to or bigger than the speed of light, I st stand here and I just shine light over there. You know. Then just by conservation of energy and momentum, if I think of light as a bunch of particles as Newton did, this light has to come out with the same energy. You know, it's just like the moon, which is reflecting sun's light. This light would have to come out, and I will be able to see this body. So these really ideas are not right. They are, strictly speaking, if you are a believer in Newtonian mechanics and Newtonian gravity, then these ideas are just not right. So attractive as they seem, the Mitchell-Laplace arguments are conceptually flawed because speed of light is observer-dependent in Newtonian physics, and strictly, there are no black holes in Newtonian gravity. So what do we need to have black holes? Well, the notion of a black hole requires an observer-independent speed of light and of course, it requires gravity. Observer independent speed of light requires relativity, and we also want gravity, so we need general relativity. And in general relativity, then, black holes can indeed exist. So the previous formal considerations were very nice, very intriguing, and might even give you the right answer in simple cases, but conceptually, they are flawed. OK, here is a space-time diagram in general relativity. Time in these diagrams always goes up and space is horizontal. So the idea was that idea is the following, that you may have some dense region in space-time, like this one. If I'm away from this dense region, then at each point, space-time is like Minkowski space, and I got light cones at 45 degrees, light cones at 45 degrees. As I come closer and closer to the body, the light cones start tilting because of the gravitational attraction. Light is trying to fall inward. And then there is a surface such that the future light cone is actually tangential to this surface, in which case all the light emitted from here, future directed null rays, will fall into this region, will fall into this region, and will not be available at infinity. And such a region in space-time will be black holes. So we needed two things. We needed these light cones, which don't depend on observer motion or anything like that. And we needed gravity to sort of say tilt these light cones as we come to the central regions. Therefore, general relativity is essential. And here are two quotes from Chandra about general relativity and black holes. The first is that is a mathematical quote. It says, black holes are the most perfect macroscopic objects there are in the universe. The only elements in their construction are our concepts of space and time. And the second one is more about what is the natural domain for general relativity, for black holes, and all the phenomena predicted by general relativity. And in his address to the International Astronomical Union, he says, general theory of relativity is a theory of gravitation. And like the, Newton, like the Newtonian theory of gravitation, which it refines and broadens, its natural home is astronomy. So Chandra had both these considerations, the considerations of aesthetics and beauty, and also he was completely well aware that general relativity should not be admired from a distance, but should be applied to the astrophysical universe. I mean, we heard yesterday from uh, Professor Narlikar that this was not his view in the early days, but certainly by 1960s, 62 was the one he decided to move into general relativity, went to the conference in Warsaw. Since then, he firmly believed that the natural home of general relativity is in astronomy. All right, so we're talking about black holes. So I would like to have one slide to say what exactly do we mean by black holes. These notions were made precise in the 70s, by, particularly by, by the Stephen Hawking, but also by um, uh, Brandon Carter and uh, Jim Barton and several other people. So what is a black hole exactly? What is the precise definition? So the idea is, as I already said, in this picture that we saw, this picture that we saw, it is a region in space-time from which light cannot escape out to infinity. So that's what we want to say. 
A black hole B is a region of space-time from which light cannot escape to infinity. But to be more precise, we draw a Penrose diagram. So this is a diagram which describes space-time. And the idea is that you suppress angles. If you like, you fix angles, theta phi, or you may have spherical symmetry, in which case it just doesn't matter which angle you look at. And so we just have an RT plane. R goes in this direction, and T goes in this direction. And the space-time is this region up here. This is, so to say, infinity. It is called personal infinity, because all the past directed light rays in space-time, in this region, will end up on this this bit, which is infinity. This is the future boundary called the future null infinity. So the light rays in this exterior, re in this region up here, will all go to infinity. But in this space time, there is a region up here, and light rays travel always at 45 degrees in the Penrose diagram. So the light cone here looks like that. And you can see that all the light rays, both going outward and going inward, fall into the singularity. They do not reach infinity. So space-time has another boundary. Infinity is not the only boundary. And that boundary is a singularity up here. So we can say, what is the region of space-time which is visible from infinity? Right? So what is the region? Well, it is this region of space-time which is visible from infinity, because if I set out a light ray from here, it can reach infinity. The second light ray goes into and falls in the black hole, but there's at least one light ray which will go out to infinity up here. And therefore, this region is all visible. And this region is invisible from infinity, and therefore, this is the black hole region. So the idea is that this is called future null infinity. This is the causal past of future null infinity. And this is called the exterior region. And from here, light can escape out to infinity. And the black hole is a region from where it cannot. So it is really the space time and minus this part and therefore, it is left over this part from which light cannot reach infinity. So the boundary of the black hole, which is this null line, 45 degrees, is the event horizon. And it is, it is the outer boundary of this black hole region. Once you cross the event horizon like that, your fate is sealed. You will not be able to escape out to infinity. You will fall into the singularity. Now, the simplest black hole is a spherically symmetric black hole, which was discovered by Schwarzschild. I'll talk about it in a second. And in this black hole, the event horizon E is a surface which just lies at r equal to 2m. The curvature in such a space-time is given by m upon r cube at any point. And therefore, at r equal to 2m, so if I put here m, 2m up here, the curvature goes like 1 upon m squared. So it's a bit counterintuitive. The larger the black hole, the lower is the curvature on the, on the event horizon. So for example, it can be quite big. I mean, in the galaxy M87, we have a black hole, which is believed to be about a few billion solar masses. If you have a black hole of about a billion solar mass, then the curvature on the surface of the black hole is about 100 times weaker than the curvature on the surface of Earth. So, as you cross the event horizon of such a black hole, you'll feel nothing at all. You'll feel something strong gravity as you approach the singularity. If the black hole is smaller, solar mass, then this quantity is enormous compared to the curvature on the, on the surface of the Earth. So the simplest black holes in general relativity. The first one I already mentioned to you is just a spherically symmetric, time independent, a static, so non-rotating, static black hole. And this was discovered by Schwarzschild. And it is remarkable that it was discovered just two months after the publication of Einstein's paper on general relativity. And Schwarzschild wrote this paper while he was serving on the, in the German army, in fact, in the front, during the f First World War. But the surface R equal to 2m was not well understood. So people thought this was just the exterior solution of a spherical star. And we don't take into seriously what happens at r equal to 2m. Because the star will be bigger than the so-called Schwarzschild radius, r equal to 2m. And the vacuum solution will only apply, solution without any matter, will only apply outside. And in fact, the black hole interpretation was not established firmly till Kruskal's 1960 papers. You know, 45 years here that passed. 
And this is just theoretically, forgetting about any observations. And there are several examples of reluctance to accept that black holes could exist in nature because of gravitational collapse. We know the famous Chandrasekhar epi and Eddington episode, and as Ed Eddington famously or infamously said, um, various accidents may intervene to save the star, but I want more protection than that. I think there should be a law of nature to prevent the star from behaving in this absurd way, from collapsing to form a black hole. And as um, we heard from Pankaj this more, just, just, just this afternoon, even Einstein actually was reluctant to talk about, to accept black holes. In 1939, he published his papers in Annals of um, Mathematics, in which he considered some distribution of matter of certain kind, and he wanted to see if, in fact, this matter could collapse and pass the R equal to 2M surface, and then something else would happen to it. But he made an assumption that the process should be quasi-static. And then with this assumption and some details of how the matter behaved, he found that this cannot happen. So he said it is impossible to form black hole through gravitational collapse. He thanks Peter Bergman and H.P. Robertson for discussions on this. And this was his conclusion, basically, very strongly repeated many, many times that there would not be a, what we call the black hole today, but to be formed through gravitational collapse. And just a few months after that, Oppenheimer Volkov paper, again, which Pankaj talked about in great detail, appeared. And it's interesting to see that the first book on general relativity was Peter Bergman's 1942 book, which was you know, three years later, and has no mention of black holes at all, even though this paper had already appeared in the literature. Then this is the simplest solution, namely the solution of a, of a black hole, which is spherically symmetric and time independent. So the simplest generalization of it would be a black hole which is rotating. But it took quite some time, 63, starting from 1915, and it was Roy Kerr who found this solution. I want to emphasize that Roy was not trying to find a black hole solution. He was trying to find solutions of Einstein's equations having certain algebraic symmetries, and he found this solution. And then, then people sl slowly realized it was a black hole, and it really was Roger Penrose who realized the full global aspect of the solution, and that it really represented the black hole. So this is the first part of the talk. Now I begin with the second one, some strangeness and proportion. So this is a quote from Bacon. There is no excellent beauty that hath not some strangeness and proportion. And I think general relativity, and particularly the theory of black holes, has this beautiful aspect. It is strange. It's not bizarre. There is strangeness and proportion. There's something which is very nice about it. So for what are the various properties? First of all, we look at the curved black holes. And as uh, Chandra emphasized, these are manifestations of pure geometry because there are solutions of Einstein's equations in vacuum without any matter. So Kerr just found one solution. But then slowly people realize that, in fact, this is a unique solution. If you wanted to have a rotating black hole solution, so a stationary and possibly a solution with possibly electric charge, that is called electrovac black hole solution, then in fact there is a slight generalization of the Kerr solution due to Newman et al., which is called the Kerr-Newman family, and that completely suffices. Now this is very surprising. You see, if you take a star, of course if you take a spherical star, then outside the metric is Schwarzschild, there's no problem about it. But if I took a rotating star, I could have a star which is rotating and which is prolate or which is oblate. It could have many various multiple moments, and therefore the gravitational field outside would be very, very different. But black holes are a lot like that. Even if you have a rotating black hole, there's only one time. And it's completely characterized by the mass of the black hole, the angular momentum of the black hole, and if there is charge, charge of the black hole. Charge is not astrophysically significant. We know that. So it's really astrophysically two parts two parameters only. All other multiple moments are completely determined by just two parameters, and this is a fantastic fact about flag black hole. But more than that, it is very interesting that this uniqueness holds for in the Einstein-Maxwell theory. That is to say, if only we have only long-range fields. If you have something like um, other fields, Young-Mills fields, skirmions, um, uh, scalar fields and so on, then the uniqueness does not hold. It hold, only holds for the long-range fields. 
it also only holds in four space-time dimension. So there is simplicity of this uniqueness precisely in the physically relevant situations. So the next episode is that this uniqueness theorem then suggested that perhaps black holes are very, very rare. Because why? Let us just look at spherical black hole for simplicity. So I got this spherical. Um, so the statement is that every non-rotating black hole is Schwarzschild. It is spherically symmetric. Now, if I look at the stars, most stars are not spherically symmetric. They are some, you know, they, are, they, they might be prolate, they might be oblate, even if they are not rotating. And so people thought that if such a ob oblate star, for example, collapsed, then since it's not spherically symmetric, it cannot go to Schwarzschild solution. Only perfectly spherical symmetric stars would collapse to Schwarzschild solution, and therefore the Schwarzschild solution, uh, therefore the black holes must be very, very rare. It is at this stage Penrose took the counterintuitive point of view, and he said, no, no, all the stars, if they collapsed, they would form a black hole. It would be a Schwarzschild black hole. But in fact, all these higher multiple moments that the black hole might have should be radi radiated away. Penrose did not have a mathematical proof of this. This was his intuition. He had certain arguments, but, but no proof. Richard Price then did some perturbative calculations. And it is only last couple of years that this has been rigorously mathematically established now due to the Fomos and Rodniansky. So the uniqueness theorem's first thought made people feel that black holes are very rare. But in fact, no. All these stars, if they're sufficiently massive, would collapse. They would fall this black hole. Their end state would be either Schwarzschild if they're not rotating, or Kerr if they are rotating. And whatever higher multiple moments they have would actually be radiated away. As Pankaj already told us, the astronomy community was rather reluctant to accept the exist existence of the black holes till early 80s. But now the time has reversed, the tide has reversed. Essentially, every galaxy is thought to have a supermassive black hole at its center. This is a slight oversimplification, but one believes that generically there might be large, most galaxies would have this. OK. Now, there is another totally unforeseen property of the event horizons. This is something purely theoretical, and this is something that was not expected at all. This, I want to emphasize, is derived entirely within general relativity. There is no external other input in it. What Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking showed was the following, that if you had a black hole, there may be matter outside, but if the black hole was actually stationary, then the surface gravity, which is like the little g on the acceleration due to gravity, if you like, on the surface of Earth. So the, black, the surface gravity kappa on the, on the black hole horizon, in the event horizon, is constant on the event horizon if the black hole is equilibrium. That is to say, if it is stationary. I want to say this is true even though the event horizon is not spherical. So for example, you may have a black hole, which may be curved. But it might also be distorted. You see, Kerr solution is a unique solution if it is completely vacuum. If there is a matter and disk outside, the black hole might be distorted. Still, it is true that the surface gravity is just constant. The second is that if a black hole makes a transition from one equilibrium state to a nearby equilibrium state, then the mass of the black hole changes. And the change in the mass is related to change in the area of the black hole times the surface gravity upon 8 pi g plus whatever work you do on the black hole. So for example, I might throw a particle into a black hole, which might be spinning, and that might add a little bit of angular momentum on the black hole. That would go into this work term. So these are the first two laws. And they, again, I want to emphasize, follow from general relativity. And if matter satisfies certain energy conditions, then the area EA of the event horizon always increases. So this is for a dynamical black hole, not given by curve solution. Some black hole is evolving. Things are falling into it. If what is falling into it has positive energy, then in fact, the area always increases. Now, the remarkable thing is that these three laws, which came purely from general relativity, have great similarity with the laws of thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, we know that if a body is in equilibrium, its temperature is constant. If I go from an equilibrium state to a nearby equilibrium state, then I get delta energy is equal to T dS, or T times delta S, plus the work done. And if, in fact, um, you have this, uh, pro if, if, and 
in general, if you go from one equilibrium state to not a nearby but another equilibrium state, then in fact the entropy would not decrease. So therefore, the statement is that this suggests that there is a multiple of this kappa which plays the role of a temperature and a multiple of A which plays the role of entropy. Now this remained a formal analogy and as, as I know that people including Stephen Hawking didn't believe that there was anything deep physics into it rather than, rather than the a formal analogy. But a year later Hawking discovered that in fact black holes radiate quantum mechanically. This is all classical relativity. If I, black holes radiated quantum mechanically as though they were black bodies at temperature T which is given by h bar kappa upon 2 pi. And then if I substitute this temperature in the first law, I find that the multiple of area, that would be like entropy, to, to have first law I will get delta energy is equal to T dS, so from that I can find what dS is, and I find that the entropy is going to be given by A upon 4 pi, 4 GH bar, or 4 Planck length squared. So now we have a temperature associated with a black hole and entropy associated with a black hole. Now that sounds very funny first because you think black holes are black. How can they radiate? They should have zero temperature. Indeed, if I went to classical theory, took the limit h bar goes to zero, this temperature goes to zero. And if I go into the classical theory, I take h bar goes to zero, entropy goes to infinity, which is what our classical intuition would tell us. But if you in include quantum effects, then situation is different. So this is fascinating because three pillars of fundamental physics, namely quantum mechanics, general relativity, and statistical mechanics are unexpectedly brought together. So this is the euphoria and we are all very happy. But now the problems. The problem is that the event horizons are extremely spooky. Now what do I mean by that? Well, they're extremely global. They refer to the entire past of null infinity, that is to say they refer And furthermore, if I make a small change in the space-time geometry, sorry, this was small, not the, a small, uh, a, a, sorry, a smooth change in the space-time geometry in a small level of the singularity can make, uh, can shift them dr drastically and even make them disappear. So the event horizons are so global that if I went near the singularity and change the space-time there, just in a small neighborhood, the event horizon might completely disappear. Now we certainly don't believe that gen, gen, what general relativity tells us in very near the singularity is all true. Some modifications due to quantum gravity will come there. So if something changed, it could happen that the event horizon completely disappears. But more worse than that is that there are, the event horizons are uh, teleological. What happens now depends on what is going to happen in the future. So it literally is true that in general relativity, an event horizon might be developing in this room right now, okay, literally, because there may be a gravitational collapse in the, this part of our galaxy a billion years from today. And they, there's nothing happening in this event horizon. The geometry is stupidly tame in this room. And yet the event horizon would form, not only form, but could actually grow. Now this is not just a kind of a general vague idea. It is actually realized in a solution. And this is a solution due to PC right there that was referred to by, uh, uh, by Jayant yesterday. It is really slightly reverse of that solution. In the solution that Jayant talked about, the, the null fluid was coming out. Here, null fluid is going in to form a collapse. So the idea is the following. Here is the same Pedro's diagram, RT plane. I got R equal to 0. R is increasing to infinity. Time is like that. And what I do is there is nothing here falling in, so this blue region is just flat. And then I have a fluid falling in this region from V equal to 0 to V equal to V naught. This fluid falls in and makes a black hole. This is the singularity of the black hole up here. And then we can look at the null infinity. We can look at its past. And we see that the event horizon starts forming in this Minkowski space, completely flat space. Not only it forms, but it grows in area. Here the area is 0. Here the area is not 0. It can be quite large. And this increase happens even though nothing at all falls across the event horizon. It's very teleological. Why does it grow? Because it knows that later on some matter is going to fall. I better start growing now to catch up with what will happen later. 
So this teleological nature makes it very hard to use in practice. In particular, we cannot really hope to generalize the first law to fully dynamical situations using the event horizon. What was the first law? The first law was that the change in the a mass of the black hole is equal to some multiple time change in the area plus work done. This was only if you went from one equilibrium state to a nearby equilibrium state. But if I have a black hole in which all kinds of things are falling in, you know, there's a disk, it's absorbing matter, there are gravitational waves, there's radiation, everything is falling in, and it say falls in for a million years, say, and I would like to know what is the mass in the beginning, what is the mass in the end, what is the area in the beginning, what is the area in the end. Well, I can't use event horizons for that. Why can't I use event horizons? Well, because in, the, in this case, the area increases even though nothing falls across it. So the change in the area of the event horizon has nothing to do with physical things happening on the surface of the black hole. And as I already meant, mentioned, to construct the event horizon, we really need to know full space-time, look at infinity, and look at the past of it, and the boundary will give us event horizon. So if numerical simulations, if people want to evolve some stars which form black holes, or gravitational collapse which forms black hole, I mean, we can't talk about, or if I have two black holes which collide, I can't talk about these black holes unless I know the full history and the full future evolution of the space-time. But I don't know that. That's exactly what I'm trying to do in the numerical evolution. So it gives rise to a bunch of conceptual, uh, deep conceptual problems. So the strategy to overcome these is to talk about quasi-local notions, and these are called quasi-local horizons. So to overcome these limitations of the event horizon in dynamical situations, quasi-local horizons were introduced more recently. And the idea here is the following. In general relativity, in the space-time, there's a notion of a trapped surface. So what is a trapped surface? Well, you take a two-sphere in space-time, just a sphere like that, right? And supposing I instantaneously illum illuminate it, so I switch on the light, and the, the whole thing is illuminated, illuminated, and I switch it off. What would happen? There's a light front which is going to go out, and there's a light front which is going to go in. So one light front, the area is increasing. The other light front, the area is decreasing. But if I have strong gravitational field up here, then what will happen is that this light front is going to decrease faster, and this is going to increase more slowly. But if you have a very strong gravitational field, then you can imagine that both light fronts actually, instead of expanding, would start contracting. Well, clearly, this has something to do with the idea of a black hole. So such a surface is called a trapped surface. And if it happens that the outgoing light front just barely stays on the surface, it neither expands nor contracts, and the ingoing light front, of course, contracts very fast, then we call, we say that we have got a marginally trapped surface. So that is the idea of the marginally trapped surface. And now the, this marginally trapped surface can be defined locally. I mean, I can just look in this room and tell you that there is no marginally trapped surface in this room. The curvature is all very low. Light is not going to be instantaneously trapped anywhere. So what the idea is that what we do is we stack these marginally trapped surfaces on the top of each other, and we construct a world tube. And this is called a quasi-local horizon. It is just obtained by stacking together a whole bunch of time evolution, if you like, of marginally trapped surfaces. And there are two things that can happen. This world tube can be null, in which case nothing, one can show mathematically that in that, that, in that case nothing falls into it. Or this world tube could be space-like, in which this invite that solution, matter is falling into the solution up here. So if it is dynamical, if matter is falling, then this world tube is space-like. If, in fact, nothing is following, then it is null, and then it is called uh, isolated horizon. So quasi-local horizons, there's nothing te teleological about it. Also, it's a huge generalization from stationary event horizons. And as I already said, there are no quasi-local horizons in this room. So it's much more physical notion. So it looks like, well, this is what we should be really talking about. But what about black hole thermodynamics? Event horizons had this beautiful property that they brought together general relativity, quantum theory, and statistical mechanics. Well, it turns out that, in, in fact, black hole thermodynamics extends to quasi-local horizons. There's a whole long series of papers showing this, 
And furthermore, black hole horizons and cosmological horizons are covered in one stroke. Even when there is a radiation arbitrarily close to the quasi-local horizon, the zeroth law holds as long as no radiation falls in. The surface gravity of a quasi-local horizon is constant. A non-trivial example for experts in the audience is a family of, non, of robinson troutman solutions, which have radiation. They have radiation in arbitrary neighborhood of this quasi-local horizon, but none of it falls in, and therefore we have, um, um, uh, we have an isolated horizon. It's a huge generalization from stationarity. Furthermore, the first law now generalizes to fully dynamical situations. The first law for event horizons we talked about was you went from one equilibrium situation to a nearby equilibrium situation. Now here I can consider a horizon in which, which is swallowing up stars, which is breaking up the stars as uh, she told us yesterday, and is swallowing all kinds of debris, and there may be radiation falling in, etc. And I can still actually look at the cross-section of this horizon, one of these marginally trapped surface, another cross-section of the horizon in distant future, and I can actually show that the area of this horizon, or area of this cross-section, minus the area of this cross-section, is equal to the flux of energy density across energy current, if like energy momentum current across the, um, you look, uh, across the dynamical horizon. So you can actually show that the radius of the dynamical horizon at time t2 minus t time t1 is equal to 2 times Newton's constant times flux of matter energy plus 2g times flux of gravitational wave energy. So here what you get is a certain positive definite geometrical quantity which we now interpret to be the gravitational wave energy following into the black holes. The experts in the audience will be surprised that there is a notion, there's a notion of flux of gravitational energy which is so local and it's very beautiful because this works only if the surface is a quasi-local horizon. If in fact it is not sliced by marginally trapped surfaces, then this quantity is not positive definite, it does not have any good, good properties, but just in this one case, it works perfectly, and therefore we have got a beautiful formula for how much energy, gravitational wave energy, is falling into the black hole. So there's a beautiful interplay between geometry and physics in this whole business. If you have presence of angular momentum, I ignore angular momentum in this formula, but if you have presence of angular momentum, then there is a similar integral form of the first law where I have additional term here. That additional term has to do with what is happening to the angular momentum. So basically, the differential first law is generalized to, um, is generalized to, um, uh, to, to an integral first law. So now, a second challenge, and which has to do with black hole entropy. Well, as we saw, the first law of black hole mechanics plus Hawking's discovery that the temperature is this tells us that for isolated horizons, the, the uh, entropy should be given by area upon 4 LP squared. Now, entropy is surprising that the entropy is actually proportional to the area. For a solar mass black hole, if I calculate the area in Planck units, you get exponential, the number of states that we have is going to be exponential of 10 to the 76. The entropy will be 10 to, e to, 10 to the 76. Now, this is a huge number of microstates, even by standards of statistical mechanics. In statistical mechanics, we see here 10 to the 23, 10 to the 25. And this completely dwarfs it. So there is a huge entropy associated even with solar blast black holes. So where do these microstates come from? Now, if you have a gas in a box, the microstates come from molecules. For a ferromagnet, they come from the Heisenberg spins. What about black holes? One might first say that, well, they should come from gravitons. But that's not the right answer because gravitons, because these gravitational fields up here are stationary. So they really cannot be gravitons. So to answer these questions, one has to go beyond classical space-time approximation that Hawking used in derivation of, classic, of Hawking effect. And we have to take into account the quantum nature of gravity. There are distinct approaches to this. There are attractive features associated with all of them, but none of them is yet completely satisfactory. And I'll just focus on one because of time. In loop quantum gravity, this entropy arises from a huge number of microstates associated with a quantum horizon geometry. So what we are counting is literally the states of the atoms of geometry 
which make up the quantum horizon of a black hole. Now, heuristically, how does it appear? So there is an argument due to Wheeler. And this argument says that you have to divide the horizon into elementary cells, each carrying an area LP squared, and assign to it um, this, each, this, this elementary area a bit, which is to say just two states. So he says that take this horizon, divide into elementary cells, little cells, into this, this, this two sphere you just divide into little, spell, little cells by hand, and assigns to each little cell of area Planck length squared, which is natural area, two states. Then the total number of states, the total number of cells is given by the area of the horizon divided by Planck length squared, and the total number of states is going to be given by 2 to the n, because each of these cells has two states, so you get 2 to the n. So the entropy of the horizon is given by log, goes like log n. But if I take log n up here, that is just equal to n log 2. This is a constant, I forget it. So this just goes like n. But I know n is just equal to a upon Planck length squared. Therefore, the area, the, therefore the, the entropy of the horizon should be proportional to area upon Planck length squared. So this was a hand-waving, totally heuristic argument that Wheeler gave. But this argument, as usual, like rough physical arguments, is very, very flawed. It is incomplete. In particular, this would apply to any two surface. It doesn't have to be a horizon of a black hole. Um, why is the area of an elementary cell just exactly Planck length squared? Where does that come from, etc.? But it turns out that using the quantum geometry in loop quantum gravity, one can actually fill in these states. And these inaccuracies can be, can, can be overcome. Calculation has to know what do we mean by a black hole horizon? What is a quantum horizon? And in loop quantum gravity, the horizon is really quasi-local and isolated. And there are some mathematical conditions which define what we mean by a quasi-local horizon. You take them over as operator equations, as boundary conditions on an operator equations in quantum theory. So basically, we are allowing this horizon to fluctuate and the fields to fluctuate on it, but they have to fluctuate in a certain way, correlated with each other, in order for the surface to qualify as a quantum horizon. So you get an operator equation, and its solution represents a quantum horizon of interest. Another correction you have to make is that the area is not given a Planck length squared, but it is given non commutative toruses, quantum U1. There is a mapping class groups. All kinds of things appear up here. There's a large number of people who have worked in this area. I just listed a few of them. Some of them are in the audience up here. It deposits a quantum of area on this horizon. And this quantum of quantum of area have to add up to the total, to total horizon area that we have given, given before. And the details say that the quantum Hilbert space of the geometry of the horizon is really described by chern simons theory of an, on this punctured sphere. So the horizon geometry is actually flat everywhere. So normally you've got a, you know, classically you've got a round sphere, it's curved everywhere. In this case, the horizon geometry is flat everywhere, but at each of these intersections, there is a deficit angle. Think of a water balloon which is hung by wires. At each time the wire actually touches the balloon, it's going to pick it up, and therefore there will be a a conical singularity like this. This is a conical singularity between, because if I go around here, the circumference divided by the radius, I don't get 2 pi, I get something less. So at a, each of these intersections, there is a conical singularity. There's a deficit angle, and these deficit angles add up to 4 pi. And therefore, this is like the quantum geometry of a sphere, and you have the quantum gauss bonnet theorem that exists in this particular case. Now we want to look, count the states up here. So as in statistical mechanics, we ought to count the number of horizon quantum states compatible with pre-specified macroscopic parameters, which are multiples of this particular isolated horizon that we're looking at, which characterize the intrinsic geometry of the quasi-local isolated horizon. And then entropy would be given by logarithm of this number of states. The result is that the entropy is equal to the classical answer that, uh, that Hawking gave us a upon 4 lp squared minus correction terms up here. These are the pure quantum, higher order quantum corrections. But this is true only for a specific value of the emergency parameter gamma. It's about 0 
So the statement is that the, the leading term is always proportional to the horizon, but to get the coefficient to be one fourth, we can we have to fix a particular value of gamma. So we use so far this is what is used to fix the value of the Barbary emergency parameter to fix the theory. If you like, this is the experiment that fixes the theory. But there are checks. I can fix it. Yeah, automatic. Right. I'm sorry. This should be minus one. Okay. Um, so the but there are checks, namely we can do this, fix by this value of gamma by considering a spherically symmetric black hole in which all the multipoles are zero except the monopole moment. Then we have fixed it, the theory is fixed, and now we can consider other black holes, rotating ones for example, or distorted ones arbitrarily, or black holes with hair, or cosmological horizons. And in all those cases, you get the same area, the same entropy, with the same value of the Barbary emergency parameter, and that is why it is a non-trivial result. Ideally, we would like to get this value of the parameter from some completely different argument. This is not possible so far, but there is still a very large consistency check. Finally, there is another fundamental challenge which has to do with information loss, and I would like to say this and then conclude. So the Hawking found that the black holes radiate quantum mechanically, and this was done using quantum field theory in a fixed black hole space time. But you have energy conservation, and therefore the space time cannot be fixed because black hole must lose its mass and evaporate. So supposing a black hole is formed by collapsing matter in a pure state. So I got some black hole which is formed by this collapsing matter up here, and supposing this collapsing matter was in a pure state. Now the Hawking radiation occurs, therefore the black hole shrinks. That means the strength of the singularity ends, is shrinking. Or here, this, the singularity is just ends up here. Or here, the strength of the singularity is like m upon r cube. And here, it is just 0 upon r cube. So the strength of the singularity wanes, decreases as we go up here. And then singularity disappears. And Hawking just wrote this diagram, saying that, well, what could happen? And there's no derivation of this diagram anywhere. One just says, well, this is a reasonable thing that could happen, that you have got kind of a nearly flat region which is associated at the very end of the evaporation up here. But in fact, for a long time, Hawking radiation is coming out, and the Hawking radiation is thermal. So I send in a pure state, and what we get is really a mixed state, and this mixed state is in fact a thermal state, so it has maximal entropy for the given energy. So in this approximation then, pure states seem to evolve into mixed states in black hole formation and evaporation, so pure states go to mixed state, therefore the process seems to be non-unitary and information seems to be lost because entropy initially pure state was zero, finally entropy is large. If this is true so, then basic structure of quantum mechanics has to be modified. Supposing this actually happened, where did the information go? Well, although the black hole has evaporated completely in the distant future, you see that in the space-time diagram, there is still a future boundary. You see, just like in the classical space-time, the black hole, future null infinity was not the entire boundary. There was also singularity. Now at the end of the evaporation, singularity has disappeared. But if I look at space-time, it still has a future boundary. And basically, where did this information go? When it went into this other part of the boundary, the entire information could not register at null infinity because there is still another part of the boundary which acts as a sink. Of the, of the entropy. So it's like the Shashat cat in the Alice in the Wonderland, namely, the cat disappears, but the smile still remains. And it acts as the sink of information. Does this situation persist in full quantum gravity, which appropriately incorporates the quantum nature of gravity geometry and not just of matter? The problem is still open in four dimension. String theory strongly suggests that pure states must evolve to pure states using this, based on this adf CFT conjecture, and therefore the information cannot be lost. But the reasoning of this adf CFT requires negative cosmological constant, and more importantly, the space-time understanding of how the information is coming out, what is happening in the space-time is still lacking. In loop quantum gravity, we know in detail that quantum geometry creates brand new repulsive force in the, brand, in the Planck regime, and resource cosmological singularities. 
This is what I spoke about on Monday, yesterday. And there are strong indications that this is also true in the black holes, although as I mentioned in answer to questions, here the analysis is nowhere as complete as that in the cosmological case. But if in fact the singularity is resolved, then we do not have a future boundary like that. The singularity is completely resolved, so space-time continues up here. And the only future boundary would be null infinity, and therefore there is no sink for this information available. Therefore, one would think that the S matrix should actually be unitary, and one does not have to modify quantum mechanics. So singularity resolution implies that quantum space-time is larger than what Einstein told us, and information can be recovered on, large, uh, on the larger null infinity on this extended space-time. So this is what you would something that we know is true in two-dimensional CGHS black holes. In this case, these are Callan, Giddings, Harvey, Strominger black hole. In this case, there is a very detailed analysis with Pretorius and his student, Ramazanaglu, and also this is a numerical analysis, and this is very detailed analytical analysis. These two together tell us that indeed, for these two-dimensional black holes, the information is not lost in the sense that the S matrix is actually unitary in this particular case. Exactly what happens in four dimensions is still open. There's some partial progress, but we do not know all the answers. So basically, what is happening is the following. If I were to draw a Hawking-like diagram in this two-dimensional space-time, then there is a remnant singularity up here, and that would act as a source of information, sink of information. Not everything coming from sky minus would register on sky plus. Some of this information would fall into the singularity. But if, in fact, this singularity is resolved by quantum effect, and therefore you have got quantum space-time is larger than the classical space-time, then the full information given on sky minus can reappear on sky plus, because now sky plus is quote unquote, as is open, but there is, there is a lot of progress in two dimension, and the work has just begun, the detailed numerical work has just begun in the four dimensional case. Okay, summary, black holes and fundamental physics. Stationary black holes have been understood, well understood for some time. Hawking et al. showed an astonishing connection between general relativity and thermodynamics. To make it precise, one needs quantum physics. And therefore, there's a beautiful convergence of ideas from three pillars of fundamental physics. But this analysis is based on excessively global and teleological event horizons. So this is euphoria followed by frustration. But then we take this frustration seriously and work on it hard. And we find that, in fact, you can get rid of the event horizons in this analysis and replace them by these quasi-local horizons. This has been used both in fundamental physics, like in quantum laws of black hole thermodynamics. It has had much more powerful and direct implications for numerical relativity, for the simulations, to extract physics out of gravitational collapse, because you can use these quasi-local horizons. We have formulae for how much gravitational waves fall in, how much matter falls in, how the area changes. So all these have been used. We can define multiple moments. We can monitor the uh, dynamics of the dynamical horizon how the multiple moments change as it settles down to the current final state, et cetera, et cetera. So it has had many, many applications, and it, it, it provides even stronger laws of thermodynamics because they're not only infinitesimal one, but we can consider finite processes. And as I said, they have had applications to computational relativity, mathematical physics, and quantum gravity. In mathematical physics, these ideas led to not uh, new relations between solitonic solutions in Einstein, Young, Mills, Dilaton theories that were not known before. Basically, you can calculate properties of solitons looking at the properties of the quasi-local horizon in the black hole solution. So there's a very nice um, so, uh, information sort of transfer from one thing to another. There are new question, namely, why is the entropy proportional to the isolated horizon area? Is there information loss during the black hole formation and evaporation? There has been a lot of progress in recent years, but these questions have not been completely settled. So as I said in my first transparency, black holes seem to have a vast potential to tease us, to vex us, and then lead us to deeper insight. There are cycles, euphoria, followed by vexing puzzles and challenges, followed by new paradigms and euphoria, 
and we are not at the end of the cycle yet. So the summary of this whole thing can be given using this quote from Virginia Woolf that Chandra always liked to like very much. So first let me tell you the quote, and at least for students I will tell you why this quote is apt. So this is the quote. There is a square, there is an oblong. The players take the square and place it upon the oblong. They place it very accurately. They make a perfect dwelling place. Very little is left outside. The structure is now visible. What was inchoate is here stated. We are not so various or so mean. We are made squares and we have stood them upon oblongs. This is our triumph. This is our consolation. The squares, in this case, would be the true black holes in nature. Sorry, oblongs in this case are the true black holes in nature. They're complicated. We don't know how to get them. We make squares. We make event horizons. We make quasi-local horizons. We have black hole thermodynamics. We place them as well as we can on the, on the oblongs, on the real nature thing, so that very little is left outside. Uh, it's very nice. This is our great triumph. But also, this is not the full story, because the square is not an oblong. So, but this is our consolation, and that is where, where we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abhay, for this beautiful lecture. Uh, we have time for a few questions. About 10 minutes is there, so I will take a few questions. Since this is a public talk, let me start from the back side, from the student side. Okay. Please. Oh. So I mean, we talked about black holes here and information loss. So what about I mean, uh, from what I heard from the naked singularity talks, I mean, is it possible that some of the information leaks during that? I mean, uh, paradigm. I mean, when it explodes, I mean, when some of it. So to talk about this information loss, et cetera, we have to talk about, we have to bring in quantum theory. And we, it's a good idea to separate out issues for which quantum theory is essential, issues for which it is not essential. So here we have to bring in quantum theory. And just as for black holes, what quantum effects are likely to do is to resolve the singularity. So also for naked singularities, it would resolve the singularity. And then the question is, if in fact the singularity is resolved, uh, and that may be a quantum mechanical region. So you may not have a well-defined classical evolution. But the quantum state should be able to go across this quantum region of space-time, and I should be able to go on the other side and see if there is no information loss or if there is information loss. Now, so the, my conjecture, my bet at this stage, is that even if one way to take at least this space-time that I know about in details, such as the ones that Christo Dulu constructed in great detail, which are studied also great detail for critical phenomena, in which there is this naked event, if you like, not a sustained singularity. So in that case, I'm pretty sure that what would happen is that you start with this quantum state in the past, and you evolve it. There will be some quantum region, quantum space-time region around what was the naked event, and you come out, and the S matrix would be unitary. I'm not shown that. It's a nice problem, but uh, that's what I expect. Actually, uh, this Hawking radiation, there was an old Hawking radiation theory and the new Hawking radiation theory. I believe I'm not very sure, but one of the Penrose lectures that I heard, uh, heard he said that there was two theories. The second one was slightly modified, which was uh, which dis did not disobey the laws of quantum mechanics, the non-unitarity. So, can you tell us a little more upon that? Yeah. So, the historical statement was that first. Hawking did this calculation only in the external field approximation. And in the external field approximation, where you keep the space-time geometry fixed, you don't change it. You don't, it's not consistent, because the, because the black hole is radiating and the mass is not changing, or the mass of the black hole is not changing. So it's not consistent. It's an external field approximation. So in this case, there is definitely loss of information. That is what Hawking literally showed. But then he made a plausibility argument by drawing this, guessing this diagram and saying what would happen in the, in the, even if the back reaction was included, even if the, you, the black hole was allowed to evaporate. And then in the 
late 70s and 80s, he wrote a series of papers saying that information, even in this case, would be actually lost. And, um, and, and then for quantum mechanics has to be generalized, et cetera, et cetera. More recently, I think it was in 2004 or something, um, Hawking actually withdrew this statement and said that there should not be information loss even in this case. As far as I know, nobody else quite understands the reason why he withdrew in the sense that he is given some arguments, but I, no, people don't understand it. And the strong uh, impetus for this came from the ADF-CFT conjecture in string theory. But on the other hand, I do not think that Hawking's or argument or anybody else's argument tells us in detail what happens in the interior space-time about how the information comes out. So that is still open. But the, if you like, the old idea was that the information is, is genuinely lost. This was Hawking's idea. It's also an idea that a whole bunch of people still take it seriously. I was told that Bob Wald believes very strongly that information is lost. I think that is very unlikely. In two dimensions, I'm quite confident that it's not lost, that the S matrix is unitary, that we, I mean, this analysis is very, very detailed. In four dimensions, we don't have detailed analysis, but I would believe that similar qualitative results would hold, that the singularity is resolved, and therefore, there is no sink for the information, and therefore, in fact, the information would come out. So the old one was that information is lost, uh, is, uh, yeah, is lost, and the new one idea is that, well, it's not lost. We should stop because we have to stop this one. Uh, this was a very interesting, uh, you know, concept, this isolated uh, uh, horizons that you uh, mentioned. Now, if I uh, recall correctly, seen her words, uh, you know, uh, used uh, apparent horizons in uh, you know dynamical situations in some of his papers to you know talk about uh, thermodynamic uh, laws. I, I wonder you know if you could uh, compare and contrast uh, or whether they are the similar things or the, what is the key? Difference? They're similar. They are not exactly the same, ah. but they are similar. Um, uh, Sean, what Sean did was. Um, yeah, he also started with this idea about the marginally trapped surface or something. There are slight differences between what one does. For example, I put in condition, those of us who worked here, put in the condition that in the dynamical horizon, the, 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 the surface is space-like from the beginning. We have this very detailed integral f laws which tell you that the area here, sorry, area in the future minus area in the past is equal to the flux of energy I, I, in the in-between region of the dynamical horizon. Sean did not have that. So there are differences. Um, the Sean's, I mean, there's smaller differences, namely Sean's particular definitions about um, what is surface gravity and what is the electric potential and so on. In the case of isolated horizon, turned out not to be quite right. It was actually already violated in some examples and so on and so forth. But qualitatively, the ideas are very similar. I can take, I just don't want to be late for the next talk. Uh, usually a quantum theory of gravity, uh, you would expect uh, there is a classical limit actually. So the classical limit would be uh, general relativity or also Newtonian mechanics, which uh, explains how apples fall. So in this uh, loop quantum gravity, uh, do you see how actually, in principle, yeah. you would go about? Uh, so, so the question is about classical. So this is nothing to do with the top. This is just a general question about loop quantum gravity. This has to do with the classical limit of general of uh, loop quantum gravity, and in particular about inverse square law or how the apples fall and so on. So, there are two ways in which loop quantum gravity has been explored. One is the canonical method, which is using Hamiltonian methods, etc., and the second is spin form approach. Within the space, which is more like the path integrals, the difference is that in the kind of standard ways of doing path integrals, one integrates or just the space of metrics, smooth metrics or something. Here, one takes quantum geometry seriously, and is, the paths themselves are quantum mechanical. So in fact, one is integrating on two complexes which are decorated with certain quantum numbers. They represent certain quantum geometries. So people have calculated the graviton propagator and in calculating this graviton propagator, in fact, they found that the particular spin form model that was popular for a whole bunch of, bunch of years by Barrett Crane was flawed, and the improvement had, was needed. 
this improvement was done. This was uh, two years ago. And the models are called EPRL uh, for um, Engel, Pereira, Rovelli, uh, and uh, Levine. And there's another model, which is, I mean, that, that really is equivalent, but the, another way of doing it by Krasnow and, and Fidel. Within these models, what one does is the following. The problem is really, if you want to calculate the propagator in a background independent way, how are we, I mean, you know, how are we going to do it? Because if there's diffeomorphism invariance, then the correlation, the two-point function here should be the same as two-point function here, so how will R come? So what one does is, let me just say what happens in Euclidean regime. I can do the Lorentzian private. So what one does is one takes a boundary and specifies a state on this boundary. So this state is going to be peaked around uh, um, uh, a spherical metric and the extrinsic curvature that this spherical metric would have in this is a three sphere in, in flat Euclidean four, four dimensional space. Now, these, given this particular state, one can actually sum over all possible quantum geometries which are compatible with this n state that is given to you. And now you can take two points on this boundary. And you can show that, in fact, the distance between these two points is actually a diffeomorphism, diffeomorphism invariant concept because I have fixed the geometry on the boundary. And now I can ask for what is the propagator, what is the correlation function in the fire And one finds that the propagator is the leading term is precisely, you know, in four dimensions, it goes like 1 upon r squared, which will be 1 upon k squared, which in the physical language would mean that it goes like the, the Newton, Newtonian force, which, is, which goes like 1 upon r. What one would like to do very much is sort of, this is just the first calculation of this propagator. One would like to develop this much, much more in order to do a systematic perturbation theory and see where this kind of perturbation theory starts deviating very strongly from the standard perturbation theory one does. So this is a program, but this is the beginning of the program. Yeah. So the statement is that this would be all, this, the whole answer is finite. The leading term is what we have. There are additional terms, so the question is, you know, how, where, so you compare now. But, I mean, the program is easy, but, you know, to implement is, to complete, is not so, so, so easy. So people are, so that is where the thrust of the action is. That's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, in your entropy formula, uh, the logarithmic term using SU2 churn summon theory turned out to be minus 3 by 2 instead of minus 1 by 2. Uh, almost similar thing when... Uh, some of us did for BTC black hole in three dimensions. Again, the same formula with minus 3 by 2 uh, logarithmic correction appeared. Uh, is there any understanding, and also recently Witten's work also from string theory gave the same kind of uh, relationship, that uh, area minus 3 by 2 log area. Is there any understanding why it should be the same in almost all dimensions? Oh, no, I don't have any understanding of why it should be the same in all dimensions at all. I mean, uh. no, I don't have. Mm. Um, I was going to tell you about mm. <laughs> recent progress using very beautiful number theory mm -hmm. to talk about these terms, but no, I don't have any. All that work is done in four space-time dimensions, the one in loop quantum gravity. We do not have work in higher dimensions, so I do not have any understanding of that. I mean, other than if, in fact, everything is described by Chern-Simons theory, then it may have just have to do with the representations of Chern-Simons theory, but that is a very vague general remark. Uh, I, don't, I cannot point my finger as to you know, what exactly in the representation theory that gives us this 3 by 2. Yeah, I can. So I described in some place the gravitational field is stationary. Uh, that's the problem we give ourselves. We give ourselves the problem of finding entropy of a system in equilibrium, and therefore the gravitational field is stationary. And in stationary gravitational field, gra gravitons are transverse traceless dynamical degrees of freedom. They are quantization of gravitational waves, and that would not happen if, in fact, there would not be gravitons which are oscillating, running around, which will make up this gravitational field. Microscopic degrees of freedom associated with the stationary gravitational field 
would not come from gravitons uh, in the standard way. 